just about three o'clock and we are or about five. to oh or five yeah that's right it's five o'clock on everybody yeah. there we go just just kidding nope that's right and we're okay. just about to get started here thank you everybody so much for for logging on to our very first um q a about all the things with regards to the cares package there's so many things going on mm -hmm. we can see the screen and everybody can hear so i think we're in good shape we've got 136 people logged on and we will get started right now thank you everybody so much for joining us again here at armenino we're definitely glad to be here and uh, glad to help in case um, you don't know who we are a uh, very large CPA firm with 1,500 professionals across the United States with our very large office there in Dallas. Our goal is to be the most innovative and entrepreneurial firm that makes a positive impact on our clients and our people. And one of the ways that we want to do that is by answering questions um, with some of the fastest changing legislation out yeah. there. And that's, and that's what we're gonna try to do today. Uh, we are one of the largest firms in the country and we've historically won numerous awards of the way that we work with our clients and uh, hope to do a little bit and show some insight on that today. With regards to everything that is going on, please feel free to go to armaninollp.com and feel free to peruse our COVID-19 Resource Center. All the questions that we're getting from our clients today really fall into uh, you know, four main buckets, cash controls and crisis management, how to access government aid, uh, what to do about people, whether it's HR issues or remote workforce, and then how to uh, communicate with those folks. So please go to that website. There's lots of content there um, that'll really show you the latest and the greatest. With that said, Perry, go ahead. Appreciate it, Dean. Thank you for everybody joining us this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Uh, Fred and I are gonna spend some time walking through and taking questions. Um, and I wanna give first and foremost, kind of uh, hope everybody's feeling well and staying safe. And these are obviously unprecedented times. So we're gonna kick it off and talk just a little bit about the CARES Act at a very high level. And if you'll move the slide for me. Yeah, just, just to give perspective, I think this is really helpful for everybody. You, everybody's heard the $2. trillion that is provided for in this act. And you can see there how it breaks down. Where's the money going? The individuals, the 560 billion, big corporations, 500 billion, small businesses, 377, and so forth. You can see how that $2.2 trillion uh, is provided. Today, we're going to spend most of our time zeroing in on what they call small business, generally referred to as uh, companies with employees uh, count at 500 or less. And within that package, and that uh, $377 billion, the vast majority of it is coming into through what is called the Paychecks Protection Program. We call it the PPP for short. It's uh, an unprecedented uh, benefit. It is, unfortunately, it is a little complicated. So what we wanna do is spend our time there fielding questions. And before we do that, we feel like it'd be good to just run through and do a level set of the basics so that each of you can hopefully, you know, uh, discern between misinformation you might've heard and things that are actually in the statute we won't, we'll try to get through this. If you feel like you don't understand some of it, I'm sure it's gonna come up in questions as we go through a long list of questions we've already received. But um, I'm gonna let uh, Fred walk us through these provisions and then uh, he and I'll field questions uh, about specifics that you're interested in. So okay, Fred, I, wanna echo Perry, I wanna echo Perry's comments about, I hope everyone is healthy and feeling good and staying safe. Um, Quickly to go through this deck, eligible companies are small business companies that meet the definition under the Small Business Act or 500 or fewer employees. Obviously, the second one is the easier one to qualify under. It also covers 
uh, sole proprietors, independent contractors, and other self-employed individuals, but all the, the five bullet points are actually eligible companies. Um, you must meet the following standards, be in business on February 15th of 20, have paid salaries or independent contractors, be significantly impacted by the coronavirus, um, that you're in good standing with your payroll obligations, mortgage payments, et cetera. The calculate, there's two major calculations. One is the maximum loan amount, and that is the lesser of $10 million or your average monthly payroll limited to $100,000 per person for the prior 12 months times two and a half. Um, the maturity, uh, this was actually updated this morning. I think the SBA had a Zoom happy hour and over hmm. Zoom martinis decided to change this to two years. Um, the interest rate has gone down to a half a percent. So those, those are two relatively significant changes. Um, canceled indebtedness is not included in taxable income. And there's various things that you need to supply that's the, the list is really kind of up in the air right now. Um, next slide. You must, uh, the owner or an officer must um, certify that they intend to use the funds for salaries, interest payment on debt obligations, rent under a lease, utilities, insurance, premiums, or other obligations over the next eight weeks. Change. Okay, the next calculation is how much of the loan will be forgiven. And so you don't need to know that number to apply for the loan, but at the end of the eight week period, you will need to take proof to your lender that you, how much you spent the money on that it, of these qualified expenditures, payroll costs, interest payments on debt, rent, utilities, uh, and then the amount that will be forgiven can be reduced by, by two factors. One, a fraction that the numerator is the number of average fully uh, full-time equivalent employees for the eight week period after the funding of the loan over the number of full-time equivalent employees you had over two testing periods, one of which is basically the beginning of 19 and then the other one is the two months beginning in 2020. Um, next slide. That was as quick as I could do that. That, that was really good. Brad. <laughs> that was good. Okay. That was really Excellent. good. So um, where to start? Um, I guess here is a slide that will uh, walk you through. This is a checklist of things you're gonna need in order to uh, establish a loan amount and then to calculate at least an estimated amount that's gonna be forgiven. And I really encourage everybody to think of this as a two-step process. First, get your numbers together to determine your average monthly payroll costs for the 12 months preceding the loan, and then project what you're gonna spend for the eight weeks subsequent to that. And that's what this checklist is about. This is something that um, comes right out of the law. And so just to give you a little background, as we have been digesting uh, the bill and zeroing in on this as the highest priority that we're hearing from our clients, this is the number one thing. There are a lot of other things that, that could benefit you, but now uh, this is a short window. Purportedly, it's gonna be a quick turnaround and this is what everybody seems to really need to understand quickly. So when we focused on this, I, this is kind of my experience. My experience was reading through this over and over. It had a lot of dates, a lot of different terms. It was very complicated. So we said to each other, hey, I need to see an example. And so we sat down and started creating an example. The next thing we did, we needed to understand, well, if the numbers change in this example, what impact does it have? So we created a template, a model, uh, whatever you wanna call it, and we'll walk you through how it works. And it allows us to both 
estimate amounts, and then look at alternatives to make strategic decisions. So I think uh, if we'll go to the next slide, we'll walk through an example here. And I know these numbers may be uh, uh, small, but if you'll focus on the first column, scenario one, at the very top, it captures the average monthly payroll costs and then subtracts the amount that exceeds the $100,000 cap. So you start with $800,000, you reduce it by the $100,000 excess to get to $700,000, and that establishes the benchmark upon which you apply the 2.5 multiple provided in the law. And at the bottom, you'll see that you're entitled to a loan for a million seven fifty. Then we project what is going to be paid for the eight week period following the date of the loan. And in this instance, you'll see that the same payroll costs are expected, 700,000 a month. So therefore for two months, you get a million four. To that, you add your uh, benefit costs, your rent, your utilities, and if you have interest, you include that. In this instance, we didn't. And the total of all that in this example comes to a million five thirty-eight. So there you have borrowed a million seven fifty and you've spent a million five thirty-eight for qualifying expenses. And when you go down to the bottom of the uh, scenario one, you will see that a million five thirty-eight will be forgiven and 212,000 will still need to be repaid. A key element in this is that your employee, full-time employee count for the look back period as compared to the eight week period following the loan are the same, 120 in this example. So therefore there are no negative implications to the forgiveness amount as a result of headcount, FTEs. So we we'll wanna to shift to scenario two and three for just a moment to highlight the uh, ability to make strategic decisions. Scenario two is identical to scenario one with one exception. The, the company decided it was in need of reducing its labor costs by 10%. And you'll see that the million four that was projected for the eight week period following the loan uh, had been a million four. Now it's going to a million two sixty. Similarly, the benefits went down by 10%, but the rent and the utilities stayed the same. This company in scenario two accomplished that reduction by in fact reducing its full time equivalents from 120 to 108 by 10%. So when you go down to find out how much is to be forgiven, you'll see that we borrowed still the same million seven fifty. We only spent out of our pocket now a million three ninety four instead of a million five thirty eight. So therefore, we already know we're going to have to repay more than we would have otherwise. However, in addition to that, because we reduced our full time equivalents by ten percent we have to reduce the amount of money that we spent to uh, attain the forgiveness by 10% down to the million 255. So that results in uh, having additional amounts that we continue to have to repay that is the 494. So I'll pause there for a second. So remember, the company felt a need to reduce its labor costs by 10% and it did so by reducing its headcount by 10%. Conversely, in scenario three, everything is the same. They still had to reduce their headcount by 10%, but they affected that by reducing the, the employee base's compensation by 10% for everyone. And as a result, when we go to do the calculation of forgiveness, we see that the headcount, the FTEs, are the same, 120 in the look back period, as well as the eight week period going forward. And now when you look down at the computation of the forgiveness, forgiveness amount, you'll note 
that the forgiveness is about $140,000 greater than it would have been in scenario two. The point that we'd like to make here, just so you'll understand, is that there is, this is not just a mathematical exercise. There is strategy to be considered. We advise our clients, first and foremost, to make good business decisions. That is paramount. But what we find here is there's an element of strategy for this particular provision to layer in to the business decisions. So again, we wanted to go through some basics. This example, try to get everybody's um, kind of knowledge base uh, kind of aligned. And we'd very much like to take questions now and see how we can help people. Now, Perry, one thing I would add, Perry, to that is, is uh, the other way that you can have your forgiveness reduced is if you reduce any employee's salary by more than 25% in the most recent quarter. And in scenario three, we only reduced people's salary by 10%. Had we reduced it by 30%, there would have been another reduction in the box uh, right underneath. You go down a little bit with your cursor. Right, there you so go. Less, less would be forgiven. You would reduce it by the amount in excess of 25%. Yeah, that's a great point, Fred. And I just want to layer on top of that is Instead of trying to remember all these little things, I think it's good to understand the philosophy of where the government's coming from. It just makes sense that they want the maximum number of people to continue to be employed. So therefore, the 10% reduction of the amount and keeping the headcount at your same level is, is what they want you to do, and therefore, they give you more forgiveness as a result. And similar to what Fred's point is, they understand reducing people's compensation is, is not ideal, and so they want to put a baseline. Something more than 25% reduction, they arbitrarily decided was too much, and they wanted to uh, inflict a, a penalty, so to speak, to an employer that did that. That's the way I kind of remember it's, it's, it. It, it just makes some logical sense, if you, I think, if you uh, look at it in that way. So... Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and we definitely have lots of questions. I hope everybody understands that, you know, we're, we're going to try not to get into, you know, individual details uh, of different yeah. companies, but we will try to um, answer as many questions as possible. And to the extent that everybody understands that this is all still pretty new and there might be some, some answers that we don't quite have yet. So with regards to that, let's get started. What if I'm a sole proprietor and don't have employees, do I qualify? You do. You do. You do. Uh, so okay. Fred, that's the uh, uh, self-employment earnings that come off the Schedule C that would be the proprietor's uh, equivalent of salary, right? Correct. And just remember that you have to divide it by 12 and multiply it by two and a half to get your maximum loan. Um, the banker that we were on with earlier today, Perry, said with respect to sole proprietors, they were going to be pretty lenient on the documentation to substantiate the 12, the prior 12 months. And, you know, I'm not saying every bank will, will do the same, but they might just take a 1099 from 2019. If it's more than a hundred thousand, I would assume that that would probably work. Yeah. It's what? still capped at the hundred thousand limit though. Right. Right. Yeah. What if they didn't pay wages in 2019? Well, the sole proprietor's net S Schedule C income qualifies he or she for uh, about $23,000 of a loan, two and a what half about, months. What about organizations that have multiple companies? Yeah, there are affiliation rules. So you're going to have to uh, consider all the different companies that um, someone owns and apply the limits both the 500 employee limit as well as the $100,000 maximum for any one employee on an uh, aggregated basis. Um, let me see here. Yeah, the question that everybody wants to know, okay, well, after we get done calculating amounts, what's the speed of, of dollars? People need help now. What does this look like? What kind of insight are we hearing on that? <laughs> uh. Fred, you got a prediction on that one, buddy? I've heard uh, 
Uh, last week I heard 36 hours, and then today I heard two weeks. So I'm thinking two weeks. <laughs> Those are the bumpers, huh? Yeah, I, I think the best advice we can give you, get that application in ASAP, get as, as close to the front of the line as possible. Is there any way to qualify for this if you have over 500 employees? Uh, well, if you meet the traditional definition of a small business under the SBA Act, or if you're in a particular industry, restaurants, uh, hotel chains, you can uh, break it up by locations. If you have 500 people, you own, let's just say you own three hotels in different cities and you have 490 locations in each city, then, then each, three, each of the three will, you don't, you don't have to meet the 500 in total, it's just 500 in location. Yeah, I okay. remember that as the Marriott rule. Marriott got in there and said, uh, as long as I don't have 500 in one hotel, let me participate, and they won. Um, what will, is this, does personal guarantees, you know, with regards to SBA loans in the past versus Statue now? says not required. Not required. Um, we talked about what will lenders be looking for? Is it just the documentation that they've been asked? that's been asked? The most important thing is the payroll records, the 941s, uh, W-2s that, that go along with the supporting of the computation of the average monthly payroll cost. That, that's the most essential thing that we're hearing. You hear anything else, Fred? Well, I just, I've heard a million different things, or not a million, but several different things ranging from if you're a customer of the bank, then um, we just really need your computation uh, accounting for the $100,000 employees and maybe your 941s and your signed statement that you intend to, to uh, use the funds for the eligible costs. If you're not a customer of that particular bank, they're going to need organizational documents, the 941s, maybe the front page of your tax return, a driver's license. I would, um, I would assemble as, as much of those items as possible and submit them, you know, over submit rather than under submit. Okay, what, um, let's talk about debt forgiveness real quick. Um, does that impact anyone's credit? If, if you apply the loan, you get money and then it gets forgiven? That's a good thing, right? Yeah, it, uh, it, it will not uh, affect credit. And I just want to highlight the fact that uh, in case people aren't really clear on this, in the business context, when debt is forgiven, it's generally considered taxable income. That impact was specifically excluded from this uh, uh, loan program in the uh, CARES Act itself. So that is a huge benefit. And you're gonna get the deduction effectively for using these loan proceeds to pay business expenses that are deductible and then when you don't ever have to repay it, it will not be income to you. So that's that's an additional huge advantage of this program. Can organizations um, apply for both the PPP and the EIDL? Fred, do you want to take that one? No. They, no they yeah, the answer is they can't, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, they can, that's what I thought. Okay, great. Uh, let's see here. Um, I think we saw some questions around for businesses that are closed by government mandate, is it most beneficial to wait to originate the loan until you're actively reopen or just apply now because you're closed? You're, you're feeling the impact now. I mean, I would apply now just because uh, at eight fifteen on Friday, they may run through the $350 billion. Okay. What yeah. is the length of employee retention required to forgive the loan? Is it eight weeks or longer? Yeah, there's a lot of defined dates in there, Fred. What, what are our thoughts on that? Yeah, it's full-time equivalent in the eight-week period. So uh, I, I assume it's not gone into that much detail, but I would think that if you kept 10 people, if you had 10 people at the beginning and you, and you fired one or let one go halfway through, then you would have nine and a half full-time equivalents for that eight-week period. Yeah, so Fred, um, I'm not aware of anything that suggests there's a, a negative aspect of if you have to start letting people go after the eight-week period. Are you? 
No. Yeah. I think yeah. that this will be extended. I'm, I'm guessing that phase four of the, I mean, that's speculation, but with the reaction to these loans, I, I think there's going to be more funds available and, and phase four will include another version of the, or an extended version of this. Right. And how do you determine if you're significantly affected by COVID-19, right? Yeah, there's no, there's no absolute on that. Uh, the language is uh, a good faith representation, I think is the term, right, Fred? That right. They're asking the borrower to make that, that they have been or anticipate being negatively impacted. And, uh, you know, my, my kind of thought process about that as just one person is that, uh, you know, uh, the shelter in place order that so many of us are uh, subject to is a, a strong indicator that a quick, yeah, that in my mind, that just seems to answer that question. Yeah, to this, just looking at this computer screen indicates that we're all significantly impacted on <laughs> yeah. doing a Zoom meeting instead of being in the office. Right. Right. Um, with regards to independent contractors and how they're defined for this purpose, you know, how do they go into FTE calculations? I mean, I don't know that that's clear, but I would, I, I believe that just like any salaried employee, you know, are you talking, I don't know if the question is referring to hours or, um, just into headcount, I believe it's just, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that's been defined, but I would think that if you use an independent contractor for 40 hours a week for the eight week period that he would be counted as a full-time equivalent. Do you agree with that Perry? Yeah, I'd say, you know, the, the 40 hour a week is usually the, the thumbnail of, of what a full-time employee is and whatever the arrangement is uh, in the, cons in the uh, contractual compensation, I would try to convert that to the amount of time they're working and measure that as a full-time equivalent, whether they're... You know, my bad, under this act, full-time equivalent is 30 hours a week. Yeah, 30 hours. Yep. Okay. Similar to benefits, that's right. Um, I, I, we know that, uh, I believe they're going to start taking loans by this Friday, right? They're going to start taking loans by this Friday. Yep. Everybody's telling us Friday is the date for the accept applications. What is the deadline date to apply for the loan? Before the money runs out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah. I mean, yeah Before that, they start shutting know. it down. Yeah. Um, if you know that you will not spend all of the loan in eight weeks, can you ask for less? Absolutely. Yes. But there is no prepayment penalty. So, I, you know, I don't want to drain the, the funds faster than they need to be, but I would probably suggest that most people are going to ask for the full maximum and then, uh, unless there are some unusual circumstances, and then just, if you want to prepay the balance that you don't use, you can. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would probably go through the calculation and just see the difference from, you know, something along the lines of our template that, that Perry went through. Yeah. And, and my thought is we now know it's going to be very cheap money. And unfortunately things are so uncertain. Now you may wish you had that money after the eight weeks, even if you do have to pay it back. So more likely than not, most clients, I would ask them to really think hard about, not taking the full amount and giving themselves the flexibility to repay it later if they want to. What about self-employment income from a partnership? Uh, unclear, oh, but we believe that that, that qualifies. Yeah, it's, it's not crystal clear, but we, we read it as it uh, can be included. Right, what about some people have half-time employees, can they be consolidated and equal a full? Any, any, any uh, information Our interpretation on that? of that would be to add up all your part-time employees and divide by 30 hours. And that's a full-time equivalent, I believe. Yeah. So right. fractional uh, workers could be added together to get to a full-time equivalent. Uh, this is actually an interesting question. Are there any programs under the CARES Act for business building and launching now? Um, who still have rent and other costs now. There is no 
prior 12 months. Maybe you have to you be know. in business by February the 15th of 2020 to qualify right. for this loan, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, and just um, a point, just a point on that, Dean, before we get off, if we didn't make it clear before, if they don't have any wages in 2019, then the look back period is the January 1st through February 29th, right, Fred? Correct, yeah. of 2020. Of 2020, yes. Great. You know, um, how does the compensation reduction penalty apply to commission-based employees? Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah. We, we talked about that this morning, and we don't know or see any exception to the fact that uh, commissioned employees are likely to have a drop in their earnings, and that that could negatively impact the forgiveness amount, but it feels like there's something beyond our control, and we don't know of any exception. Agree. Yep. Okay. So here's another question that kind of goes along with that. Do all items that are paid through payroll qualify as the 12 month prior period, as well as the eight week forward looking time? Well, the definition of payroll cost uh, is salaries, wages, health insurance, retirement benefits, and similar compensation, including contract labor. So not everything that's going through payroll, but most things. Right. What, um, you know, some, some companies out there use PEOs, um, professional employment organizations to manage payroll, HR functions. Those still qualify as, as their employees, right? I would say yes. Fred, any other thoughts on that? Nothing specific, but I got to believe the answer is yes. Um, yeah, significantly. Oh, um, do partner guaranteed payments count toward the payroll calculation? Yeah, I mean, it's just cap. We that that is that is less than crystal clear, but our view, our read of it is yes. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think this goes along. Must you spend at least 75% of the borrowed funds on payroll to possibly have the entire amount forgiven? That, that came out last night. That is not part of the law, but it did come out last night over the Zoom happy hour, I believe. Um, for the entire loan to be forgiven, you have to spend 75% on payroll of the money that you expended. Great. Just to um, interpret what Fred just said real quick, the, the happy hour that evidently the SBA group had last night, and they had too much to drink, best I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we're seeing a lot of, of questions around a topic of, you know, this is federal funding. Is there any other requirements that happen when you take these dollars uh, with regards to compliance or, you know, insight into how you want to run your business or if you're a nonprofit, do they have to, do they kind of get strings around your program? A any insight there? But, you know, we asked this, that question of the banker that was on a panel with us this morning and, um, you know, what happens at the end of the eight weeks and your loan is not forgiven and you owe them money, how do they determine the, the terms? And he, his answer was, we don't know. We asked the SBA yesterday. So we don't know the answer to that, but I, but I gotta believe your credit history and your financial ability to repay is factored into it. Right, um, you know, we're seeing some people who say that they're involved in, um, in real estate, commercial real estate, and their tenants aren't able to pay for um, their upcoming rent obligations. Is there anything for, for the landlord? And, and basically, does he just have to go tell his tenants to go apply for this money? Yeah, so there's, uh, I've been thinking about this. There is no provision that I have seen or heard of in the act that speaks directly to this. But I do know that tenants are going to landlords and, land, and they're negotiating for some rent holidays or leniency and so forth. And I think that if I were a landlord, I would say to the tenant that I want to work with you, but to the extent that you can borrow this money on a uh, forgiveness basis, I want you to pay me with those funds. And then maybe 
um, you know, negotiate something after those funds are gone. So I don't, I think that we have an opportunity to educate real estate industry to probe on that with their tenants. Um, what about, can the employer tax expense or 401k employer match, uh, does that need to be factored in? Another gray area, but we say the retirement benefit, the retirement plan contributions that are matching would be included. It appears that that's one of the points in the law, but, but it just says retirement plan benefits, I think. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to applying for, you know, both EIDL and PPP, um, can you apply for the e EI, the EIDL loan for expenses not covered under the PPP? No. Yeah. There's a concept in the act about no duplication of benefits, meaning pick a, pick a program that fits your needs best, get the maximum benefit, but only one program. Uh, let me see here. Are we to exclude? Oh, what about international employees or internationally owned businesses? Are they eligible? My recollection is that no, they have to be employed in the United States, but I, I would yeah, have to. I think, I, I think I remember that the actual language, you're right, Fred, that uh, employees must have a primary residence in the U.S. I don't think if they go abroad temporarily, that kills them, but right. they have to, primary residence, I think, is the language they use on that. Right. What about um, seeing some questions about, you know, layoffs and, you know, this says, uh, if you laid off your employees, then you get the loan, then you rehire them back. Is that going to work? I think there's some timelines in the, in the laws. What, what, what are we thinking there, Fred? It's eight. It's uh, the, the eight weeks following the date of funding on the loan that you calculate your uh, full-time equivalent employees. Are we hearing anything um, from our network and community of, of banker friends on how this might impact loan covenants for our clients. Like if they have existing loan covenants and they go out and they get these dollars, have we heard anything yet? That might I be haven't heard a long. word on that. It's a good question. Fred, any thoughts there? Yeah, a conversation I had at noon today with probably one of my bigger clients. Um, they, uh, they need to get clearance from Pack Life before they do this. Hmm. Um, what is the eight week time frame, Fred, that you mentioned? What determines the start date? Uh, date of, of uh, date of funding of the loan, I believe. Um, okay. What about, here's one for home and home-based businesses is the full amount of rent and utilities forgivable or only a portion based on home office calculations? A creative crowd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> getting a lot of getting a lot of stuff. Yeah, um, I'm I'm guessing that if you have a home office that's dedicated to your work, and uh, let's take a 2,000 square foot home with a 200 square foot office that doesn't have a, you know a 60 foot 60 inch big screen TV on it in it, then one tenth of those expenses would qualify. Do you agree with that, Perry? Yeah, I do. I was going to say, similar to the uh, home office rules. Right. What if you outsource some things, uh, some operations of your business? Um, can those labor costs uh, go to, you know, your application? Or it seems like that would go to the service provider. That's part of their, their application. Well, if you're issuing a 1099 to a service provider, you can capture that. Is that, I'm not sure if I understand the question right. Does that sound like what they're asking, you think? Yeah, it says, you know, we outsource a couple different components of our operation, whether it's food service and, and janitorial things. And um, can we claim labor costs or does the service provider claim those labor costs? I would think that the service provider needs to claim mm -hmm. those. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, how is the prior 12 months defined? Can we? 12, 12 months for the maximum calculation is the trailing 12 months from the date that you apply for the loan. And I think there's some flexibility, but I would look at the 
last three quarters of 19 in the first quarter of 20. Yeah. We might not have the answer to this one, but you know, what if your owners live in another country, but you have employees here in the, in America? We don't know. Okay. I, That's a good question. I, I have to look into it. I think, it, I think it works, but I could be wrong. I don't know. Fred, any instinct? No, I don't have any instinct on that. That's uh, I can, unfortunately I have the act on my other screen. So keep asking Dean. Yeah. Okay. Um, entities like LLCs with no payroll. How do you apply for a PPP? They don't have payroll. Only dividends. No. Unfortunately, out of luck, I think. Right, Fred? I mean, yeah. if it's an LLC that's performing self-employment income type tasks, then you would get the, you know, you'd be considered an independent contractor. But if you're talking about a, an FLP that owns a bunch of stock and stuff, no. So. Um, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier, but we could re re uh, revisit. How are self-employed payroll costs determined when the only employee is the sole provider? So your, uh, your sole proprietor schedule, Schedule C, computes income and expenses to arrive at a, a net income amount on that Schedule C, and that is subject to self-employment tax. And so that is the payroll cost uh, for that proprietor. Great. What about, let's talk about consolidated entities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have some consolidated groups that are made up of uh, you know, different companies. How do, how is that going to work with regards to employee calculations? I mean, I think the affiliation rules are going to make you accumulate all, all of the companies and submit one application. I, it's unclear from looking at the application how exactly they want you to do that. But, I, I, you know, you have to, you can't have this, the same employee making $120,000 in each company and count them three times at 100. Right, yeah, so it sounds like one app one application. Yeah. I agree with, with the concept. I don't know what they're going to demand in terms of uh, who the borrower is, but I would aggregate. Um, with regards to our example, not only payroll, but rent utility expenses can also add to the loan amount calculation. Those items actually don't don't impact, recall that I said, it's a good, good way to think about this as a two-step process. First, you establish the loan amount, then you determine how much can be forgiven. And those rent and utilities are not included in the loan amount computation, but in fact come in on the forgiveness computation. And, and my read of that is that they're loaning you two and a half months but right. they're only measuring two months afterwards, and they're therefore allowing you to layer on these other expenses. Does that make right. sense, Fred? Yep, that's exactly right. And when you're looking at rent, what about things like taxes, CAM, common area maintenance, things like that? How's that going to be impacted? The, those items that are considered utilities would be included in the, the, in the list of expenses eligible to be forgiven in your forgivable loan amount. Um, let's see, here's an, a question with respect to the examples, what would happen if an employer added to their workforce? That is to take on more employees, contractors, instead of reducing. No, it's a grocery store. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a zoom. It's, it's a zoom style. It's, zoom. it's a zoom. That's right. <laughs> Or a toilet paper manufacturer. Oh, yeah, that could be. Um, it, does, it, it helps them get the maximum forgiveness, but they don't get any benefit over and above that right. I'm aware of. Yeah. No. What about with regards to where, where are these, these funds coming from? Is it only going to be SBA preferred lenders? Is there anything about bigger banks versus smaller banks? What are you guys hearing there? Well, all banks can make these loans, but, I, but the banks that are not SBA lenders currently have to apply. And so they're scrambling around trying to get approved. And I would say to play it safe, you need to go with an SBA bank now. Yeah, that'll expedite it, I agree. Okay. 
Um, yeah, again, more, more questions around commissioned employees. That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so uh, let's see. If you must bring payroll back to previous levels during the eight week period, what do you do for commissioned employees who don't make commission unless they are working? Well, the forgivable amount is determined on a head, on a head count basis. The only uh, amount that would be reduced would be if, if their payroll went down by more than 25% in the most recent quarter, if I'm understanding the question right. What about bonuses? Where do bonuses go? Does, does this count in salary amounts? I mean, yeah. obviously we have the $100,000 limit, but yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we have somebody here. Let's see. Uh, prior. Okay. If we add employees during our eight week period, would they count towards the ratio of FTEs prior versus current? Oh, how about here? And if you don't, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Up to okay. 100%. Yeah, up to 100. Yeah, 100%. And then, is there any benefit in applying with different banks? The one, one, might, most, one may get it, one may not. Nah, the only thing that we're finding is that banks are telling us that they're going to prior, prioritize their existing customers. So, in terms of worrying about money running out, I would say get in early. And if at all possible, go with the bank that you have a relationship with, they'll likely prioritize you. Right. Um, oh yeah, to qualify, do we need to meet, do we need to meet the SBA uh, NASIC size rules on revenue? No, there's two criteria, one, one or the other. That rule, the general rule for an SBA loan is uh, $15 million in equity and f less than $5 million after tax for the, each of the prior two years. But the easier one is less than 500 employees. If you meet that, you're a small business for uh, purposes of this loan. Okay. Um, let's see. Do leases include phones, copiers, printers, or just building rent? Um, well, our interpretation is it does include some of those other items. Agree. Okay. Uh, any idea when the final PPP application will be released? I think it, it was released last night released. about five o'clock. Yeah. Okay. It's out. Great. Um, Let's see, should the average payroll calculation be done by each specific employee in order to determine the amount over 100K? Or can you calculate a total average employee number and total average salary per employee? No, I think you need, you need to go to your payroll records and actually accumulate pay for the last 12 months and to the extent they exceed $100,000, they're limited to 100. So the, the calculation that you submit to the bank is probably critical. They're not going to have time to check all these in detail, but if you don't do it that way, your loan's going to get kicked back. Yeah. Okay. What can we do between now and Friday to help expedite this process? What are you guys hearing? Uh, get your numbers together. We're encouraging uh, people that we're working with to get their numbers together. Uh, we're looking at them with them. We're trying to look and see if there's any strategic uh, uh, approach that will benefit them to maximize forgiveness and then get their payroll reports to support their spreadsheet, their business return from a prior year and anything else that their bank says they might need and um, get in line. We're really suggesting people move as quickly as possible. I would suggest that everyone First of all, make sure that the bank that they do business with is an SBA bank and then just call your banker and ask them what they're requiring because the, the documents are different for each bank. And if, you, if you're not banking with an SBA bank, find one that, that you think will take your application and find out what they need because they're going to need more information from you. And every banker that I've talked to said, send the stuff as soon as you have it. So don't wait till Friday, you know, send it in as soon as you have it assembled. 
What is the set? Oh, no, no, here it is. This is a good one. What about private equity backed companies? That's a complicated question. Um, so we've, we've referenced these aggregation rules where you have to take um, multiple companies and add them together and apply the tests. And um, it appears in the uh, SBA guidelines um, control is the factor rather than percentage ownership. So um, it's quite possible that uh, PE groups would have to aggregate their portfolio of companies, but we really are uh, suggesting we look at that on a case by case basis. Brad, yeah. do you have other thoughts on that? No, I mean, that's the conclusion we came to, I think. Yeah. 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 We definitely have a lot of questions around aggregation and, you know, um, different facilities and different companies, right. but we definitely mm -hmm. are seeing a lot of questions there. Yeah. Um, what does the quote unquote number of jobs mean on the SBA application? Is that the FTEs? Let me look. Yeah. That, do, we, do they say where the reference is? Oh, um, that's FTEs, I think. Very top of the form, third or fourth line. Yeah, this one's an interesting one. Can you apply for the loan now, but try to delay origination until May? Um, that would be what? That would be a month. I, you know, we don't know the approval timeline, right? Right. I mean, I think you can, but I think you stand the, the chance of the funding being gone. Sure. What about, um, what about uh, I've seen some things about uh, potential you know, we know that nonprofits apply here, but what about charter schools? Do we have any thoughts on that yet? I mean, if they're considered the the employer, they can and not affiliated with another group that has more than 500 employees, then uh, you know, I think they're fine. I think that mm -hmm. is that not right? Your understanding? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's right. It's just the aggregation they need to be uh, mindful of. Um, let's see. Let's see, um, we've got a construction contractor. It's after the average monthly payroll, the application asks for a number of jobs. Is that the number of jobs we are currently contracted under? Is that what they're kind of alluding to there? I, I, that's, on a, that's on a line that they're computing the maximum loan amount. So I think they're talking about full-time equivalents. Yeah. Got it. Um, again, more questions on this. Do you need to make a loss during the period to apply for the loan? Do you, do you have to have a loss? No. No. Just be affected, right? Right. Impacted. Impacted. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I didn't hear. Okay. I didn't hear anything about offshore employees or offshore contractors. Anything about that? I don't think, is that not part no, of it? No, it's got to, it's got to be uh, em employees with uh, U.S. residents. Okay. Um, for a nonprofit, do we include employee wages and payments to individual independent contractors in average monthly payroll costs? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Here. Yeah, here you go. Another aggregation question that probably is going to need some individual look, but I'll ask it anyway so you guys can confirm. Are skilled nursing facilities allowed to break up the size limits by locations like hotels? Hmm. I don't think that they qualify under NCAIS code 72, so I don't yeah. think so, but I can look. Um, any guess as to how long it will take for this funding to be gone? Is it a couple of days or a couple of weeks? Do we have any idea? I would say it could be somewhere between a couple of hours and a couple of days. I don't know about weeks. I don't know. I, I, that's just an instinct and maybe everybody's overreacting, but. It does seem like this is the topic that a lot of people are spending time on, right? Yeah, right, this correct. Is, COVID-19 is real and it's impacting so many people. Okay. When submitting the employer expense for benefits, are we looking at the same prior 12 month period or 2019 in total? 
prior 12 months. Yeah. I think there's some leeway based on conversations, you know, uh, you can look at 19, but and if, if it's obvious the number is about the same, I don't think they're going to kick the loan back. Right. Um, yeah. How about this? What if your employees don't want to come back? <laughs> what yeah. if they, they can make more money on unemployment? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Is there anything else? I think we're hitting a lot of these. Um, I think with regards to mission and taking the dollars for a nonprofit, um, I don't know if we have that insight yet into that, right? Like if you take federal money or, or all of a sudden, does that change how you, what you can do with your mission or what you're doing? You know, I, I think that's a question for the nonprofit folks. I'm not sure I can comment on that. Okay. Uh, do you include dental vision, um, as to, uh, you know, state long-term disability and benefits or just health insurance? I think if it's, if it's a group benefit, I think all benefits, isn't that right, Fred? Um, what about, um, let's see, what if employees started mid-year? You know, say you have a hundred thousand dollar employee that started seven one nineteen. I mean, I think he's a a fifty percent FTE full time employee, and his salaries, if it's less than a hundred, it's included it in the counts. computation. Yeah, all counts. Okay, let's see. Uh, more impacted. I think we're we're. We've got a lot of them. Some of the questions that we've got are, are so specific that, you know, they definitely require a deep dive. So we're not going to try to address those on here. Okay. Um, let's see here. Trying to see anything else. Uh, let's see. Can you apply for a loan now? What is the number of jobs? We already have that one. Oh, we got one new one. Here we go. Let's see. Is it correct that a 501c6 are excluded from payroll protection loans. What is a? That That's also be. out of my realm. I'm not yeah. sure about that one. Better. We do we do have nonprofit um, uh, specialty cool. group here at, yeah. at Armenino, so that one could be a question um, that we can circle back on for sure. Or if one of our nonprofit partners is on the the Zoom, they could text me the answer right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, how about this? Um, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Can you give us a clearer understanding of all that is included in leases and rents? Copiers. Uh, yeah. the, 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 the act actually says rent, parentheses, including rent under a lease agreement. That's all the guidance we have. So our interpretation of that is copiers, those type leases also are included. Okay. okay. All right, well, we're almost at the end of it. Um, and let's see here. Yep, yeah, for with regards to the specific nonprofit questions, we'll circle back with that one. Um, Non-specific question, I think we answered it, but maybe on the tail end again. Where do you see past 12 months being trailing? It says 2019 on the SBA sample form for the loan. Well, that may be a change that the SBA made. It's uh, trailing is in the law. Uh, let me check. Yeah, the law says 12 months prior to the date of application, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I see what they're talking about, but the law says the trailing 12 months. If this application says 2019, that that makes the computation a little easier but it might not be as beneficial or it might be less beneficial. Okay, and then lastly, with regards to those rent payments, did you, did we think, what do we think about the taxes on those rent payments? Taxes. You know, the pass through, I mean, I would, my, my instinct is if the lease agreement says that's part of the rent, then occluded, but if it's, if it's not, I don't know that it's, in, um, and provided for in the law itself. I agree. Yeah. Okay. And with that, thank you so much 
for everyone for joining. Obviously, we, we understand that this is topic number one and the most important thing. Uh, Perry and Fred, do you have any closing remarks? We'll definitely go through and, and uh, you know, see if there's any way that we can help anyone. If anybody needs to reach out to Fred or directly, yeah. please do that. Perry, any, any, anything else? Yeah, I, I just want to suggest to you that, as we said at the front end, that the bill has a lot of things in it. There are a lot of ways that uh, companies can be benefited that, that are in their uh, NOL carrybacks, uh, qualified improvement deductions, and so forth like that. But this is the priority first but it's not the end. So uh, right. wishing there everybody a bigger good picture. health and safety. Yep, absolutely. Great. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.